Thank you again for the opportunity to share with you God's word in my heart this morning. Um, for those who are new or watching online, my name is Barry Yarbrough. My family, Vanessa, my wife, our three kids, Belle, Merida, and Maximus, um, send greetings. Um, and we have been serving in Mexico City for the past seven years as international workers, the new term for missionary, um, sent by the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada. Our family of churches have faithfully and generously walked with us these past seven years, and we are so thank thankful for this church and your partnership with us in the gospel. As we return to Mexico July 23rd for another four years, we will be transitioning from church planting, which I spoke about last time I was here, to coming alongside of the Mexican Christian and Missionary Alliance to equip them and mobilize them to send Mexican international workers themselves. This is an incredibly historic moment in the church's history for us, the Canadian Alliance, to be a part of. Let's go to the next. Is it on? Oh, I'll turn it on. Sorry, I turned it on. There we go. The CNMA started work in Mexico in 1947 by two Alliance Bible Seminary graduates, Eunice Sawyer and Velma Green. With effort and prayer, they initiated a church plant and Bible school in Mexico City. One of their disciples, Ramon Esparza, would go on to establish the alliance in Mexico starting in 1963 under the USA CNMA, which led to expansive church planting in the north of Mexico and church groups joining the alliance in the south and west of Mexico. In 1983, the USA CNMA removed the Mexican church from being a department, a district of the USA to autonomous governance. In 1983, a committee of national Mexican CNMA pastors formed the constitution of the CNMA in Mexico, making it an independent church. This opened Mexico to receive missionaries from the USA and Canada CNMA churches, with Canada sending their first international workers, Cecil and Eunice Smith, in 1983 to plant churches in Mexico City. The Mexican CNMA today is about 76 churches across the country. They are self-governing, meaning that they don't need outside oversight to determine governance. They are self-sustaining, meaning that they don't need foreign finances to function as the church. They are self-reproducing, meaning that they don't need foreign resources to plant churches. The CNMA in Mexico is multiplying among Spanish speakers and reaching indigenous peoples in Mexico who don't have a strong church presence, some of whom still need a complete Bible translation in their dialect. This development needs to be celebrated. The USA and Canadian investment in Mexico has done its job. And now the Mexican CNMA is on the cusp of becoming a sending church to participate in God's global mission. They are at the historic moment of joining the other Alliance World Fellowship national churches like Canada that are sending like you saw in the video. And this is how mission work should go. W. Harold Fuller developed four stages of mission work. The first stage is as a pioneer. In the case of Mexico, the USA CNMA sent two women to pioneer a church planting work. The second stage of mission work is the work of a parent. The mission helps to develop and encourage the young church like the USA CNMA did with Ramon Esparza to establish the church planting expansion in Mexico. The third stage of mission work is as a partner assisting the new, the now autonomous, maturing and growing Mexican CNMA in their church planting and expansion like the USA and Canadian CNMA did by sending the Smiths and subsequent others like Paul and Cindy Inns to partner in the work in Mexico. There is much less oversight and direction given to the Mexican CNMA in the stage, but they are still developing the necessary structures and governance to truly be an independent church. 
as the Mexican CNMA has developed into a church that is self-governing and self-supporting, self-sustaining, and planting churches among Spanish speakers and indigenous peoples in Mexico, the Canadian IW team has moved into the fourth stage of mission work in Mexico as participants in the work of God in Mexico where a partner has equal say in how things should be done or move forward, a participant specializes in what the Mexican CNMA would like to see accomplished. And this is a great thing and how it should be. We, we now get to be specialists working with the Mexican CNMA to help them create the systems and the structures and the processes in the denomination to sustain sending IWs for generations. We get to saturate the denomination with God's global heart and champion Mexicans going to the ends of the earth, participating in God's global mission. God has providentially prepared Mexicans for his mission among those with little or no access to the gospel in the world, especially among Arabs. The out of all Latin American cultures, out of all Latin American countries, the Mexican culture is the closest similar culture to the Arab world. As you can see on the graph with four cultural distinctions, Mexico is in line with all of those Arab countries like Algeria and the United Arab Emirates. As a distinction, you can see where Canada is almost completely opposite to Mexico and the Arab world. Spanish and Arabic share 4,000 similar words, making learning Arabic from Spanish that much easier. If you place a picture of a Mexican and an Arab next to each other, they are indistinguishable in skin tone and facial features. When I showed my wife these pictures without the titles, my wife got them confused. God has given Mexico a favor among Arab nations. In the United Arab Emirates, a Canadian can only receive a 20-day visa to enter the country. Mexico is the only country in the world that is granted an 180-day visa to enter the United Arab Emirates. God has prepared and given favor to Mexico to reach the world, to peoples with little or no access to Jesus. So, what is mission mobilization? What is the specialized task that we are being sent to Mexico to help accomplish? And the clearest logic we have for mission mobilization comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15. And in Romans chapter 10, Paul shows how the Bible records God's promise of salvation through redemptive history. Romans 10, 9 issues the promise that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's the gospel, you will be saved. Then the promise in 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's an incredible promise, and Paul is making it very clear that everyone here is not just the Jewish people whom God first gave the promise to, but all nations, all the people groups of the earth. When you see nations used like this in the Bible, you should read people groups because that is the truest meaning of the term nations in the Bible distinct cultural and linguistic ethnic groups. This is the mission of God. The mission of God is the extension of his salvation to the ends of the earth among every people group. But Paul sees a problem here that he addresses in chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. How does the gospel get to all the nations? If God's mission is the salvation of all people groups, then how is this accomplished? And here's Paul's mission mobilization logic. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how are they to believe in him in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. According to Paul, God is fulfilling his mission in the world by gospel message bearers being sent to preach the gospel of salvation. Paul's logic is clear. If gospel message bearers are not sent to preach the gospel, then no one will hear and no one will believe and no one will call on God for salvation. The task of the church as God's missionary people is to send and to be sent. Christopher Wright wrote, The mission of God requires the realities of sending and being sent as part of the mission of God's people. But where is Paul getting this mission mobilization logic from? I believe it runs throughout the entire Bible because the whole Bible is the record of God's redemption and saving purpose in history. The Bible is the record of God's mission to bless all the nations of the earth through his salvation. And we see him sending people to participate in this mission. God mobilizes people for his mission in the world. Some Old Testament examples of people being sent to proclaim God's salvation. Take Moses, for example. Moses was sent by God to proclaim the salvation of his people from slavery in Egypt. If you remember the story of Moses, he was born as a Jew but raised in Egyptian royalty in, in, in solidarity with his Jewish heritage he kills an Egyptian that is abusing an Jewish slave and runs to the desert in exile. In a burning bush, he encounters the living God and is, receives a calling on his life from God for the redemption of God's people. And of course, we know the story of the 10 plagues and, and, and God setting his people free and from slavery. And Moses is God's spokesperson to the Israelites. Moses prefigures Christ as the better prophet like Moses who would carry God's authority and proclaim God's salvation that Jesus would accomplish in victory over death and sin and Satan. Another example, Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah was a prophet sent by God right before the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity. In, chapters, in chapter 6, verses 1 to 9a, Isaiah is in the throne room of God being sent by God, receiving a calling of God for himself. And although most of Isaiah's message is of repentance, it is also God's triumphal salvation to the nations, like the messianic passage speaking about Jesus in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 and 6. That says, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Again, read people groups. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet sent by God who would witness the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of the Jews by Babylon, God sends him with a mouth filled with the words of God. Chapter 1, verses 4 to 5 and 7 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah gives excuses of why he can't be sent by God. And God responds, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Like Isaiah, most of his message is repentance, which causes him to suffer. But he also got to tell of God's triumphal salvation to the nations. Like Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 17 
At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, we see God sending message bearers, and the nations are almost always in view for God's triumph and salvation. In the New Testament, God continues to send people to proclaim his salvation to the nations, but he starts with sending himself. God, the Father, sends God, the Son, Jesus. More than any other book in the Bible, the Gospel of John captures the sending nature of God for mission. John writes in his narrative about the life of Jesus that Jesus was sent by God the Father. We see very clearly in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. God takes action in his mission to bring salvation to the peoples of the earth. He does this by sending God the Son to live the perfect life we cannot live, to die the death our sins deserve, so that humanity can be forgiven based on what Jesus has done. And he rose from the grave, defeating sin and Satan and death, so that we might be saved. But as we saw from God sending message bearers in the Old Testament, God continues to do that in Jesus and then in the disciples empowered with the sent Holy Spirit. And so God the Father and God the Son sends the Spirit. In John chapters 14 to 16, we see Jesus preparing his disciples for the mantle of mission that he will be sending them to accomplish. In John chapter 16, verses 5 to 7, Jesus teaches, But now I am going to him who sent me. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit is sent by God the Father and God the Son to be a helper, a teacher to the disciples. As the Spirit of truth, he will will bear witness about Jesus and his presence with the disciples will be of greater advantage because the Spirit will continue the mission of God, Jesus, one to all the nations of the earth. In Acts chapter 2, we see the Spirit being sent and the church begin to carry on the mission of God as Peter preaches the gospel of Jesus and people from various languages, people groups, nations hear the gospel in their own language. Before Acts chapter 2 and the church is launched to fulfill the mission of God from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth, God the Son, Jesus commissions his disciples to be sent. They need power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the commission of Jesus to them, but Jesus sends them in his authority. And this is what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17. Situated in the passion narrative leading to Jesus' death and resurrection, since it is the gospel that the disciples will be sent to proclaim in all the world, Jesus audibly prays to God the Father in the hearing of the disciples. And in this prayer, saturated with the sending nature of God, Jesus declares in verse 18, As you, Father, sent me into the world, so I have sent them, the disciples, into the world. Jesus roots the sending of the disciples in his own sentness. The disciples are to go into the world in a like manner as Jesus, carrying on the mission of Jesus. As the narrative of John continues, John has come from the Father, Jesus has come from the Father, died for the sins of the world, rose from the grave, and now is departing as we read as 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 we read in in acts earlier all other stories would stop here with a satisfying catharsis but the works of jesus are not done yet 
as he has been preparing his disciples for and as the Holy Spirit will be sent to accomplish through the church. In John chapter 20, Jesus has brought his disciples all the way to the moment of speaking peace from watching him die and rise again and commissioning them with a mission. John records in verse 21. He says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Again, Jesus puts the sending of the disciples in the framework of his sentness. The disciples are to look to Jesus for their mission. And in a grander sense, how to live on mission like Jesus. As Jesus did nothing except what his father told him, so too are the disciples to obey the teaching of Jesus as applied by the Holy Spirit. As Jesus submitted himself completely to the will of the Father, so too are the disciples to submit themselves wholly to the Lord, to their Lord and Savior, Jesus. As Jesus engaged and identified with others of society and the nations, so too are the disciples to take a missionary posture so that all peoples will hear the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Christopher Wright reiterates, the mission of God's people then is not some external structure built by the church itself, a program or a strategy devised by an institution. Sending in mission is a participation in the life of God. The mission of God's people in this dimension of sending and being sent is to be caught up within the dynamic sending and being sent that God, the Holy Trinity, has done and continues to do for the salvation of the world and the revelation of truth. So what about us today? As disciples of Jesus Christ, saved by his death and resurrection, we follow in the footsteps of the early disciples. The book of Acts clearly shows that the commission of Jesus to his disciples was not limited to the first disciples, but was to be reproduced in every new disciple of generations of disciples. In Jesus' ascending prayer in John 17, Jesus includes future generations of disciples when he prays, I do not ask for these only, the first disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Just like the first disciples, the church today is called to be sent, to send, and to pray for God to send. We are called to be sent, to send, and to pray for God to send. We are called to be sent. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20 is very clear in this. It's the great commission that hopefully we were all aware of. And and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Again, read people groups there baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Very clearly, we see that Matthew 28 gives us our mission task. The main verb here is make disciples. We are to make disciples. The main focus of what Jesus is commissioning us to is to make disciples that are baptized into his name, are followers of him that declare him as boss, ruler, and king, and teaching them everything that Jesus taught and did. We are to reproduce Jesus in others so that they can reproduce Jesus in others also. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 gives us our mission focus. Matthew chapter 28 gives us our mission task. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 gives us our mission focus. 
It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is not a linear progression when one stage is complete. We are to be sending to accomplish all of the task. We don't get to stay around Fort Capel until every single person has come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our mission. We want to do that. But we also are called and commissioned to see the nations hear about Jesus at the very same time. We are also called to send. We are called to be sent and we are called to send. We saw the mission mobilization logic of Paul in Romans chapter 10 that the church should be actively sending so that the gospel will be preached, so that people will hear, so that they will believe and be saved. And Romans 10 gives us the reason for sending. Likewise, 3 John verse 6 gives us how we are to send. John speaking to the church in in Gaius' house about the missionaries that are passing through his town says, you will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Here we have a clear direction by the apostle John to a local church to send the missionaries passing through in a manner worthy of God. There are many ways that a local church can send missionaries in a manner worthy of God. But at the very least, the implications here in context, and especially if you look at the other New Testament writings, are with prayer, with finances, and with ongoing encouragement and support. We see that clearly here. We are called to be sent. We are called to send And we are called to pray for God to send. As Jesus is apprenticing his disciples, teaching them to follow him in all that he was doing and saying, he sends them out to the surrounding villages to proclaim his message. He is sending out his workers. But Matthew shares that Jesus sees the crowds and has compassion on them. The people are lost and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They are lost and vulnerable to the world's attacks and violence. In his sending, Jesus starts by stating, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We are called to pray earnestly, passionately, desperately for God to send more gospel message bearers. The mission of God rests in God. This prayer for God to send more workers in his mission reminds us that God is in control of his mission and he is the one who sends in his mission. It reminds us of our purpose as a disciple of Jesus to be sent gospel message bearers to those lost and helpless. Praying this should help us to prioritize our lives around God's mission. As we pray this, it also opens us to God's calling to be sent. We pray for more workers and realize that we are God's means called and sent for the spread of the gospel to our neighbors and to the world. The church oftentimes pats themselves on the back for praying Luke chapter 10, verse 2. For the Lord of the harvest to send out those people into his harvest. But I wonder if oftentimes we plug our ears at verse 3 when Jesus immediately says to you, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. As the church today We are called to be sent, to send, and to pray for God to send more workers. We have a great tradition 
in the Christian and Missionary Alliance of sending gospel message bearers to the hardest and darkest places in the world where there is little or no access to the gospel. Our denomination was started in the 1890s with the vision of A.B. Simpson, one of history's greatest mission mobilizers of the church for the mission of God. He understood that mission was subsequent to experiencing the fullness of the gospel of Jesus in a believer's life. Simpson advocated for a deeper life in Christ of the believer and the church. He stated, such a salvation, so complete, so sufficient, so far reaching, so free is enough to set on fire the hearts of angels and to make the men that have received it burn with desire to pass it on to all the race of humanity. In an Alliance Convention sermon in 1899, he summarized the Alliance movement by saying, were I asked to state the distinctive principles of the work of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, there are two things that I would say. First, it stands for an absolute faith in the supernatural things and a supernatural God. It represents a Christianity which is out and out for God. And it gathers to it those and only those who believe something and believe it with all their heart and soul and strength. In a word, it represents intense spiritual earnestness. And secondly, along with this, as the outgo and the overflow of this deeper life of faith and consecration, it represents intense aggressiveness in its work for God. An overflow and an outgo that is ever reaching on to the regions beyond and seeking to pass on to others the blessing we have received. The Alliance movement therefore represents spiritual earnestness on the one hand and aggressive activity on the other. This dual alignment of the deeper life in Christ and mission was the heartbeat and driving force behind the whole motivation of the CNMA and it continues to be today. Our mission in the Canadian Alliance is sending international workers to be God's agents of transformation in the hardest and darkest regions of the world by multiplying followers of Christ into movements of faith communities, churches, local churches. Our sending, the Canadian Alliance is sending around 175 workers engaged in church development, the marketplace, business for transformation, mobilization and relief development all with the purpose of planting indigenous churches. Our district churches like Valley Alliance in partnership with the CNMA in Canada has sent Vanessa and myself. We are a part of your obedience to the mission of God by you sending us. Our giving, the Canadian Alliance sends international workers through a cooperative fund called the Global Advance Fund that covers everything to get an IW to a region and to keep them there. The IW's ministry partner fund is raised by the IW and is used to cover all the ministry costs of the IW. You have graciously been giving to the Global Advance Fund that keeps our family in Mexico and our kids educated. Thank you. Our partner churches and individuals have been graciously supporting our ministry partner fund so that we are able to partner in planting Quorum Deo to disciple two couples for a year, to run an alpha course and to purchase a vehicle, to remodel our backyard and extend hospitality that leads to gospel conversations. Your committed giving is a part of the obedience of our family of churches to participate in God's global mission in our partnering our seamless links with partner churches have been an incredible encouragement for us as a family we have been praying for our district churches and we are encouraged as we see your prayers answered in mexico we commit to regular updates through our midweek prayer pick that you can sign up for and it's and it is encouraging to hear from pastors about our district churches so that we're able to celebrate with the church, to mourn with the church, and to pray with insight for the church. Church visits to Mexico have been tremendous 
in encouraging us and advancing the mission in Mexico. On one visit, a seamless link church, Westgate Alliance in Saskatoon, sent a team to run a race, a road race with me and to participate in some of the ministries alongside of us. I enlisted them to join me at a board game language exchange where you play board games and practice English or Spanish. And I asked them to intentionally guide their conversations to spiritual things. And if the person seemed interested, to introduce them to me so I could invite them to a coffee to follow up with and hopefully start a relationship to to share the gospel with them. At the end of a language exchange, Colin Friesen introduced me to a guy named Daniel, the guy on, on your right. I was able to follow up with him after a few months of busy schedules, and we started going out for breakfast on a monthly basis. Often our conversations would lead to spiritual things in Jesus because he had grown up in a Catholic school but felt rejected by the Catholic Church. We, we would invite Daniel to our Thanksgivings and our suppers and increase his spiritual awareness with us. I invited him right before we came back to Canada to join us for an Alpha and he came almost every week. He was so committed to attending Alpha that one week he came in bleeding bandages. He had wrecked his bike and was tossed over the handlebars, scraping along the pavement. One whole arm was a bloody mess and his face didn't escape punishment either. But he came to our Alpha because he valued being at Alpha with us. He joined us for, Alpha, for the Alpha weekend and we were able to minister to him with prayer. He didn't accept our invitation to join us at a local church and so I went to breakfast with him to follow up and he said Alpha helped to stabilize his faith but his expression of faith at that moment wasn't in a local church. I thanked him for his honesty and, and we, had, we made plans to continue to meet with brec- for breakfast the next week. God is the one who saves. But I would have never met Daniel and been able to invite him to clearly hear and talk about the gospel in Alpha years later if Colin Friesen from Westgate Alliance Church had not come to Mexico, played a board game in the food court of a local mall, and introduced me to my new friend. This is what a seamless link means for us. We want to say thank you for your participation in the mission of God. Thank you for sending us in a manner worthy of the Lord, according to 3 John 6. Two verses later in verse 8, John encourages the church by saying that their participation in sending and supporting made them fellow workers for the truth. You are our fellow workers as we partner together in Mexico. I want to thank you in advance for being a part of mobilizing the Mexican CNMA with God's global heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your good news. And because we are so overwhelmed and thankful for the salvation that we have received, we can't keep it to ourselves. Good news is good to share. And so, Father, you send us to share that which we have received so graciously, so lavishly. And, Father, I pray that you would continue to use your church here at Valley for their community, for their province, for their country, and for the ends of the earth. Oh, God, there is still millions of people that will be born and live their entire life and die without ever having a chance to hear your good news. Oh God, use our family of churches. Use us to send that gospel to those people. God, raise up new workers from this church to spread your good news to those who don't even have a chance to hear. And oh God, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of joining you in your redemption, your salvation in the world. 
Oh God, we proclaim the gospel. And you said in Matthew 24, 14, and then the end will come. Oh God, come soon. Help us to fulfill the work of the gospel to all the nations. In Jesus' name, amen.